A warm welcome to our attendees for this webinar. The authors and I are very pleased to introduce you to these intriguing new books. I'm Samantha Baskin, Distinguished Professor of Art History at Cleveland State University and series editor for Dim You Note, Jews and the Cultural Imagination. Volumes in Dim You Note explore the intersections of Jewish experience and culture. These projects emerge from many different disciplines as these books will demonstrate and all of them in this series demonstrate. This includes art, language, history, philosophy, music, cultural studies, you name it. And this is across time and geographical locations. Each volume, however, you know, as a whole, these volumes interrogate the multiple and evolving representations of Judaism and Jewishness by both Jews and non-Jews. And to this point, there are 15 volumes in the series and three in the works coming out soon. Just a, a housekeeping note, unfortunately, Beverly Bella, Ballas, who, was, who is co-editor of American um, Hebraist Essays on Agnon and Modern Jewish Literature by Alan Mintz is unable to join us today as planned, but the book is still el eligible for the 40% discount code that you will receive via email after this event. We hope you'll take a look. So first, um, I'm gonna ask each author to tell us a little bit about their book, then we'll open it up for a discussion and they'll be taking your questions. At any point during this webinar, you can submit a question via the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So during the presentations, whenever you have a question, and if your question is for a specific author, please note that for us, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. We are going to begin with J.H. Chayas. And he's going to talk about, he's the, he's the Sir Isaac Wolfson Professor of Jewish Thought at the University of Haifa. He's the author of Between Worlds, Dybbuk's Exorcists and Early Modern Judaism, and he's director of the Illinois Project. His forthcoming book is The Kabbalistic Tree. It is so beautiful. I'm really excited about it. Please tell us about it. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you to everybody at Penn State University Press for uh, producing such a beautiful book. And the, for the time being, I'm taking your word for it because I haven't yet seen the advanced copy, but um, I was thrilled to publish this book with, with a press that has such a, dis a distinguished reputation for beautiful art history books in particular. And um, nice to see the overlap between uh, the Jewish cultural imagination and art history, even in your own person, Samantha, as an art historian. So I felt the book was in good hands. Um, and uh, let me say a few words about it. It's called The Kabbalistic Tree, um, which is a very literal translation of what the artifacts to which the book is devoted are called in Hebrew. In Hebrew, uh, the term is uh, Ilan Kabbali, or Ilan means tree in Hebrew. Kabbali, just like you can hear, is the Hebrew way of saying uh, Kabbalistic. And uh, I think at this point, since uh, at the very least, I think everyone on the planet has seen a rock star with a Kabbalistic tree tattooed somewhere on his or her body, uh, it's, it's, it, it hardly needs to be explained to people that there's this uh, I, iconic uh, image of a tree that is associated with Kabbalah. May, maybe not everybody understands exactly what it symbolizes or what it's doing, but as an image, I think it, it has a fairly high degree of recognition, even uh, well beyond the Jewish world. Again, I, I, I probably shouldn't make all of these references to tattoos, but I get a, a number of inquiry, inquiries every month from tattoo parlors around the world. So I, I have this kind of uh, impressionistic sense of the broad interest of, uh, of people uh, all over in, in this image. Uh, but the, the Kabbalistic tree actually within the history of Jewish mysticism 
can refer to either just that iconic image of of the tree, which represents uh, the definitive uh, content of Kabbalistic thought, in other words, the, or the uh, you know the the Kabbalistic idea that kind of is, uh, defines uh, and distinguishes Kabbalah as an esoteric science. I think that would be a way that the Kabbalists would appreciate being described. Um, and, and, and that is uh, the Kabbalistic tree represents the 10 Sfirot, or the 10 luminous emanations that according to the Kabbalah are uh, the fundamental building blocks of all of reality, beginning with uh, the Godhead itself. So there's this image that's used to represent these fundamental qualities or categories uh, that uh, Kabbalists uh, talk about going back to roughly the 12th century. But then around the 14th century, Kabbalists began inscribing these figures on large parchment sheets. And they did so um, in the beginning for a number of reasons, but uh, the well, I should say, I suppose the, the main reason seems to have been going back to the very beginning that uh, transferring this image to a new large medium enabled Kabbalists to uh, enhance the content that could be offered uh, by means of this diagram. And that enhancement primarily took the form of uh, in additional embedded text that uh, created a kind of uh, a kind of uh, memory palace in which all kinds of uh, material that was relevant to this esoteric lore could be inscribed on the very place to which it um, belongs in Kabbalistic uh cosmology so instead of just reading a book saying let me in this is an introduction to kabbalah you need to know something about each of these 10 spherot um, you get a map and you have the 10 spherot each one in its proper place and then in each medallion you'll get content that is specific to that sphira and perhaps the best thing to do is to share a screen and just give a quick sense of of what I'm talking about. I've shared a screen. I think it, it came up uh, initially. Well, I, I can't. This isn't exactly what I was talking about just now, but the, the person in the picture is William Gross, uh, uh, an incredible human being and one of the great Judaic co collectors of, of our age, uh, who was the person who collected these parchments before anyone even knew what they were. And thanks to his collection, really, uh, my whole project uh, exists. But let me show you an old, uh, an old Ilan, an old Kabbalistic tree. And now here you see, I hope you see at least, the question is how I can maybe make you see it just a little bit better. This is a you know, uh, a 15th century parchment, and I don't know how well you, you can see it, right? You can see something on that I'm, that I'm sharing. Um, I hope you'll say we're still seeing uh, Mr. Gross. Really? Yeah. I've switched it on my shared screen, but let me see what happens if I try this again. Um, yeah, let's try it like this. How is this? There can you now go. see an old? An old Elan. So you can see this is an old, quite uh, uh, rough piece of parchment that's been folded uh, for storage and delivery. But uh, it has this uh, tree schema that has been filled with texts that tell the student various things that one would need to know about the Sfirot in order to engage with this lore. Um, both to study Kabbalah and to pray 
uh, Kabbalistically. So um, one of the interesting things about these artifacts is that they're actually tools used by Kabbalists. We know relatively little about Kabbalistic practice going back hundreds of years. But these are uh, ritual objects. They're parchments that were created in an, an era when all parchments used by Jews were ritual objects, as they are today. So um, I, I um, let me stop the share. Um, when I discovered about a decade, a little over a decade ago, uh, these artifacts, I immediately uh, went looking for literature to find out something about them and only to discover, as had Bill Gross already before me, that there was nothing to read about them. There was not even an entry in the Encyclopedia Judaica. So uh, at the same time, you could see them on book covers as eye candy. Anybody publishes a book on Kabbalah, they would take uh, an image from one of these artifacts, but the the books would never tell you anything about the images and none of the really uh, seminal volumes on Kabbalah by Gershom Sholem or Moshe Idel or Elliot Wolfson uh, said a word about them. You won't find Ilan or Kabbalistic tree in the index of any book you have in your libraries. Notwithstanding the fact that Kabbalists have been producing these since the 14th century, and there are uh, scores of them in libraries and in private collections around the world. So as soon as that penny dropped, I realized that there was a genre of Judaica that was unresearched. There was a genre of Kabbalistic creativity that was unresearched. And even though I, I didn't have a background as an art historian, the truth is that art historians aren't really equipped by their professional training to deal with these either. So it's they they one of the reasons I think they were unresearched was because they fell between the cracks. People doing Jewish intellectual history didn't know what to do with images and people doing Jewish art history didn't take interest in diagrams and and in images that aren't artistic and that require a fair amount of um facility and familiarity with, with the intricacies of Kabbalistic thought to, uh, to understand. So I, I saw this as an incredible opportunity to establish a new field of study and have spent the last decade of my life working on it, uh, thank, thankfully with a number of wonderful uh, postdocs and collaborators. And the Kabbalistic tree is the uh, you know, the kind of the magnum opus that has emerged from uh, over a decade of immersion in this field, trying to find these scrolls in libraries around the world and uh, to kind of figure out uh, how they, what, how they uh, relate to each other chronologically, what schools they represent, uh, the, the whole gamut of questions, there was nothing done. So a field had to be established. The, the book, The Kabbalistic Tree, is, you know, it's, it's kind of different books all rolled into one. It's a, it's, a, it's a coffee table book that you can buy and enjoy for its over 250 uh, gorgeous, high-resolution color images of Ilanot, of Kabbalistic scrolls that have never been seen before in print. The eye candy that I mentioned before was largely taken from one or two things that people knew about, but this is a, an entire world of, of incredible images. Um, it's also uh, a monograph, an academic monograph, a scholarly monograph that basically establishes what this genre is and gives a, a history that's uh, uh, both chronological and you, know, you might say typological or thematic um, and, um, and encyclopedic because although by, you know, by, by the nature of this kind of thing, as soon as the first, as soon as the book 
is published, it'll be time to start thinking about the second edition because this is the this is this is the first book on the subject ever uh, ever written and ever published. But it's also only the first book, and because the field is is still in its in, in its infancy, uh, the discoveries continue. There's there is more and. I continue to learn new things even after, uh, you know, submitting the final manuscript. So, but as of now, it's a pretty good encyclopedic treaty so that, you know, whatever someone's interest is in imaging Kabbalistic ideas, Kabbalistic thought, um, this book will, will be the, will be the place to go, the place to look. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure how much uh, I've gone over or I've gone under, but I would just say that uh, I'm, I'm thrilled for the book. And uh, the one thing that I, I can't do in the book is offer opportunities for people to dive into high resolution exploration of these, uh, of these artifacts and uh, but there's good news, which is that if uh, people go to www.ilanot.org, I-L-A-N-O-T.org, you can see a beta version of, um, of another piece of my project, which was uh, done in collaboration, which is underway in collaboration with the University of Göttingen's Digital Humanities laboratory and um, with the generous support of the Volkswagen Foundation, and that is to create interactive uh, Ilanot, Kabbalistic trees that include full Hebrew transcriptions and English translations and explanations of the great Kabbalistic trees. So I hope that kind of taken together, these will uh, completely revolutionize the way people uh, think about Kabbalah and Jewish ritual and meditation and study and all of that. And thank you again. Thank you. It's an intriguing book. Um, so let me now introduce Yael Halevi Wise. She's Associate Professor and Chair of Jewish Studies at McGill University. She's the author of Interactive Fictions, Scenes of Storytelling in the Novel. And her latest book is the one she's gonna talk about today. It's the retrospective imagination of A.B. Yeshua. It's also great. I love his work and I love the way you talk about it. So please share about your book with our audience. Thank you. So um, a little over three months ago on June 4, 14, this last summer, the Israeli literary landscape changed and my life changed also because uh, the central, uh, well-known and much beloved Israeli writer, Aleph Bet Yoshua, Bully, as we used to call him, uh, his nickname since he was a, a, in, in high school, Bully, uh, uh, is no longer among the living. Uh, now, somebody who, le who leaves after him 12 major novels, many, many, many short stories, many lectures that were turned into published essays and collections of essays and were published, scores and scores of interviews and many, many contact with uh, thousands of people because he was a very friendly person. That kind of person can never uh, fully pass away, but still, uh, it has been a very painful time because those of us who knew him personally uh, were befriended by him, as were many, and and uh, that, that that worked on on his that worked on him and also knew him. Um, we could always ask him questions, not that he necessarily answered them. Uh, he usually did not, but we could try. And uh, it was always an ongoing conversation. So for me, um, the relationship with this author started 
when I was a teenager, I had already read his works. When I was a graduate student uh, at Princeton, I had an opportunity of being a student in a class that he taught while he was on sabbatical there. Um, and Samantha just mentioned the title of my first book, Interactive Fictions. There's a chapter on, one, on his masterpiece in that book. After that, I, I wrote, uh, I edited a collection of, of works in, he, in which he was also featured in one of the chapters written by someone else, but uh, the, the, the case study was instrumental. And at, at some point I said, what's going to be my next project? And I decided I should do a major uh, book on Albert Joshua of the kind that had never been done before, not on him, uh, nor quite like this on any, on any uh, Israeli, on any Hebrew writer. And what I decided to do is to imagine a student who goes to one of these secondhand bookshops and finds a book by A.B. Oshua, never heard of him, and she takes the book home and she can't put it down. Any of his novels, she can't put it down. And she's like, who is this writer? What else did he write? What was he trying to do? What was the context in which he was writing? And then reaching out for my book, and my book would put all those questions into perspective. So there have been already several collected volumes uh, and even a, a monograph or two about A.B. Yoshua, but they all deal individually with each of his works. Uh, and they deal with it chronologically. What I wanted to do was rather to take this bird's eye view in order to draw out the major themes that recur in his work and also the patterns of composition. What makes A.B. Oshua special? What makes his type of, of, of compositions unique? Uh, where is this coming from? What is it about? To place it both within in the context of his own worldview and also in the context of his of the times and so forth. So it is this kind of bird's eye view that takes certain themes in his work that nobody had noticed as such. For instance, uh, his use of holidays which is his way of embedding a situation in the present of the fiction within the larger story of Jewish life and Jewish history in dialogue or kind of wrestling also with religion. For instance, the, the, the role of vocation in his works that each of his characters is a very specific type of professional. There might be aspiring, uh, an aspiring surgeon who ends up being an anesthesiologist. There is an elevator engineer. There are judges, lawyers, many teachers there. The professions of the characters, there's a garage, a car repairman that owns a garage. These professions of the characters are very, very important for Yoshua as part of his description of the character's uh, um, identity. Uh, so I try to explain how vocation is a major topos in his work and also his own vocation as a writer is a kind of reincarnation of the vocation of the prophets, of the original prophets uh, of Israel who felt the need to speak uh, truth to power and to uh, uh, guide the people. And indeed in Israel, not so much with the new writers, but with this older generation of writers, among them uh, Amos Oz and Aleph Bet Yoshua, their books were looked for uh, to as guidance of how should we digest our, uh, our 
the state of our nation. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we used to joke, he would tell me, you know, it took a few years to write this book. And he would say, no, why is it taking so long? Just, you know, do it. And I would say, no, no, I'm not going to just do it. I want to do something uh, serious, comprehensive and permanent. And when it was done, uh, he was already suffering very much from cancer, but he did get a copy. And then he kept asking us for more and more. It's too bad that the book was not at a 40% discount then. <laughs> he wanted one for his translator, for his other translator, for, for uh, his library, for the other library. And he and he was, uh, was quite gratified. And he says, yeah, and now I see why it took you so long. So that, that was nice that we were able able uh, to bring this to him. And I want to say a few words uh, about also why I chose uh, this particular uh, press, Penn State University Press. Um, so he, here's the, the, the book, uh, as you can see, you can imagine uh, Bully getting this book, putting it on his desk, seeing his face. I would have actually liked uh, a photograph where he's wrestling and ar because he's arguing with, like with his hand, you know, like a good Jew, and and, and that is more like his his uh, the way I have him in his mind always in my mind always arguing. But one of the um, one of the reasons that I chose Penn State University Press is that when I was about halfway done, I had written uh, maybe three of the major chapters. And I said, I really want an editor that I can discuss things things with that 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 would really support me. You know, like sometimes you see in the acknowledgments, thanks to the editor who was there supporting us. I want that kind of editor. And also, I was halfway done, and I was very worried because one of my chapters is an introduction to all of Yoshua's novels and to his worldview by putting the plots of his novels literally on a map. So on a global map, on a, on a uh, national map, on a local map, which I chose Jerusalem as the locale, and to describe in this way what they are about and what is troubling him. I'm sorry, 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 this is, <laughs> and, um, and um, so I saw that Penn State University Press was able to work with, with graphics, and I did not find many other presses that were able to do that. I also saw that they had the series of Dimionot, and for me, the idea of imagination of the literary, the literary mind as an imaginative mind is key. And today we tend to get away from this concept of the imagination in art and we tend to think more in sociological terms. I'm doing that too, but above all, to think of the imaginative um, mind, creative mind at work. So um, I saw that in Penn State, you could do all this. And my editors, uh, the editor of the series and the editor of the press, Patrick Alexander, an interlocutor who really said, yes, you can do these maps. And, uh, and we're going to work with you on them. That gave me the the courage to go on with this project and to understand it was possible to go on the way I envisioned it. So um, here you see one example. There are 10 maps in the in that one chapter, which gives the worldview of A.B. Oshua through these maps. So here you see his masterpiece, Mr. Mani, which is told in five conversations. I'm going to be very brief. Here is one that is set in a conversation that is set in 1918 when Jerusalem was conquered by the British. And so all of these points 
within the text, I explain how the characters are describing interactions with all kinds of people from different ethnicities, religions, and nationalities. And all this takes place in, in within different lo locations of Jerusalem. Now that happens in that book. It's a historical novel. It happens through many uh, layers of the city's history. And then here's another example of, them, of another map, and I will wrap up with this. This is conversations about Jerusalem that are happening in all of his novels among characters who are located in all of these places that you see in this map. So there are, there are characters who, in Africa, there are characters in somewhere in the steppes of Siberia, there are characters in, 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 in the land of Israel or Israel itself, in Europe, etc., Spain, they're saying uh, all kinds of things about Jerusalem. And through this, we begin to understand the, the perspective that Yeshua has on, on Jerusalem, on Israel, on Zionism, on Jewish history and so forth. So that is only one of the chapters. Uh, but it, it, I just wanted to share it because of the graphics and because I am so grateful to this press for having worked with me on this kind of book. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really am so pleased with all three books. Your book is great. I've read it three times, seriously. <laughs> um, now let's welcome Lior Sternfeld. He's Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. And he's the author of Between Iran and Zion, Jewish Histories of 20th Century Iran. He's also co-author of the new book in the series, Jews in Iran, A Photographic Chronicle, which features the work of photographer Hassan Sarbakshian and commentary by journalist Parvane Vahid Nash. And it's so great. Um, it's, I have it actually sitting next to me. Photographs are just phenomenal. And I hope you're going to show some. Please let us know a little bit about your book. Uh, thank you so much, Samantha. Um, let me start off. Uh, you know, we're talking about Iran today, um, October 2022. Let me start off with a word of solidarity with the brave. Uh, women and, and men in the streets of Iran tonight protesting uh, for the rights and, and against the government and all the power to them. Um, second, I want to uh, repeat the, the words of my uh, fellow panelists. It was such a delight uh, to work with uh, Penn State Press uh, on this book. Um, and really, um, I have just the best words to, to describe this process. Um, this, this book started uh, in 2015. Um, I was working on my first book, Between Iran and Zion, that talks about the experience of Iranian Jews in the 20th century in Iran. Um, and, um, and working on Iranian Jews is something that finds, I, I mean, it makes you face so many uh, intellectual obstacles. Uh, one of them is that people assume that because of the relations, the nature of relations between Iran and Israel today, uh, there are no Jews in Iran. Or if there are, they are hiding or, uh, you know, images of Anusim or Soviet Jews behind the, the, the Iron Curtain. Um, and this is one challenge. The second is, that, that as an Israeli citizen, I could not go to Iran myself. Um, so I lived through archival sources in ways that other can, you know, other can complement what they read with, uh, with visiting insights or seeing and feeling, smelling. Um, I, I lived through uh, archival sources and, and photos and, in 2015, uh, a mutual friend told me, come to, uh, to DC, I have to introduce you to uh, an Iranian photographer, uh, and I, I wish Hassan or Anne Parvane could join us today. Um, and we were sitting in a, in a restaurant in, in Maryland, and, uh, and Hassan showed me hundreds of photos that he had taken um, of, of Iranian Jews 
uh, in the 21st century. And immediately I felt that this is something that must see the day of light uh, because, um, you know, when I talk about Iranian Jews, people assume that there's an ending point uh, to this history. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have to explain that actually the second biggest Jewish community in the Middle East today outside Israel is in Iran. And it's not to say that they, uh, that they have no uh, challenges as a Jewish community, but they are there. And the beauty of the photos that, uh, that Hassan uh, had taken just to show that they are a living community, that they, uh, they travel, they work, they have their businesses, they have politics, they have culture, they have history, they have, uh, they visit, um, you know, they go on pilgrimage to uh, Jewish shrines, they share shrines with, uh, with Iranian Muslims. Um, here, for example, we see uh, this is a Passover Seder night in Iran. This is an event, a political event that uh, Jewish representatives were uh, taking part of. It was one of the celebrations uh, for one of the anniversaries of the Islamic Republic. Now, once we see them in this setting, we can start talking about the difficulties, the challenges, the things that we should know, the things that they want us to know, but it creates a basis of knowledge. and and when Hassan was still living in Iran, Hassan and Pavane, when they were still living in Iran, they tried to publish it um, and they, uh, they got a refusal, very harsh refusal from, uh, from the uh, censorship in Iran. And, um, you know, I thought that this is the opportunity to uh, really to bridge between the Jews of Iran that live in Iran and the Iranian, uh, the, the Iranian Jewish diaspora, the Iranian non-Jewish diaspora, uh, people who are interested in in Jewish life in the Middle East and 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 many more. There is something that really there is a feeling when you um, when you see the photos. You don't feel like you're uh, that you're in a museum and you see art object that you must not touch. Quite the contrary, you feel like you're part of their. You you sit in their city in their living room and you go to their shops, and you can even if you listen carefully, you can hear the conversation in the uh, in the bus trip. Um, so um, this is what we try to achieve, um, and. Um, I, I, I want to be, uh, not to take too much of the time, but I, th I think that the book achieved it. It's a beautiful production. Um, and, um, and I encourage everyone to, to have this. Uh, it, it sits so well with the <laughs> previous books that were uh, presented here. And, and um, I'm grateful for uh, everyone who's taken part in it. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers today and your terrific books. Um, we're going to answer some questions from our attendees. We don't have any questions yet, but so please submit a question at any time during this question and answer. And again, if your question is for a specific author, please be sure to note that. Um, I have lots of questions, so I can begin and hopefully we'll get some from our audience. But, you know, it's interesting how each of you have created these new books and they're based on your, your past research. You know, you have an entire body of work that's informing each other. And if you want to address that, like you're sort of like your program as a whole as authors, what are you trying to say? And in, you know, with this book, how does it build on the past? And what is it going to tell us about the present, both in your work as well as Judaism? So if someone wants to start, please do. Well, if nobody's uh, jumping, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first. Um, I think that this book, um, again, because Iran is something that is so remote from our world, uh, this book allows us to, to see the places that I've written on. Um, so if someone uh, wants to see uh, what Jewish classroom looks like in, in the 21st century in Iran. 
what do Jewish kids do in recess? Um, the Jewish hospital, what the shape of synagogues and, um, you know, in terms of art, uh, art history or architecture, you know, Jewish establishments, um, this book gives them the visual that my written work cannot, cannot do. Uh, and and it, gave, it gave me the opportunity to see the places that I've written on um, in ways that I, that I could not see it before. Um, that's, that's, my, that's my take. My, I, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll go in reverse, or reverse order. From, yeah, I guess um, the, the way we could use my book to answer those questions is, is that Yoshua was always getting us to ask deeply within ourselves and in regards to Israeli history, Israeli politics, and Jewish history, to ask where do we come from and where are we going? Where are we coming from and where are we going, first of all, as individuals within our own psychological development? Second of all, as family units in a constellation of family units that form a nation and, and, and form uh, uh, contacts between different nations. And as, as Israelis, as Jews, as human beings, all the time that those relentless questions, where is all this coming from? And with what you have, where are you going? And if you don't watch out, where might you end up? And so he always forces us to go back and ask anew at all of those levels of existence. I have, um, I suppose, a, a little a different uh, kind of answer in terms of my own personal journey as, as a scholar and student, uh, it's it's so I guess by uh, by nature inclination, uh, I've I've never been interested in entirely disembodied ideas. Uh, I'm not really a philosopher, but I've always been interested in uh, the look this. You know, this, the, 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 way that, the way the ideas uh, find expression in real life, what's going on um, in practice with real people in their real lives. So although I, I, I studied uh, Jewish thought and studied the history of Kabbalah, um, I didn't want to, even as a graduate student, uh, I didn't want to write a, a book on some aspect of Kabbalistic theory, symbolism, um, some abstract ideas. So I ended up going in a kind of historical anthropological di direction. And I wrote my first book on spirit possession in early modern Jewish culture, um, the, the, on uh, the Dibbuk, basically, and uh, how Jews uh, understood this phenomenon of uh, spirit possession and how Jews exorcised spirits and uh you know i did kind of an anthropological style analysis of the the literary uh materials that uh, could be mined to explore these kinds of questions i also for example was bored frankly by endless discussions of the the feminine in kabbalah the the Shekhinah and so forth. I said I wanted to know what women were doing in the 16th century who were living uh, in the in the with the, with the Kabbalists who were writing about the Shekhinah. So um, my book, uh, that first book, includes a chapter on women's religiosity, which had was closely related to spirit possession. It turns out, 
Um, and I mentioned the Encyclopedia Judaica before, but one of the one of the happiest moments uh, of the of my you could say of my career post uh, publication of that first book was seeing in the second edition of the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Judaica women who I who I discovered getting entries in the Encyclopedia Judaica um, for their contributions to the history of Jewish mysticism. So um, in a similar way, turns out, uh, I've just written a book, this book, The Kabbalistic Tree is about the, it's really about the practice of Kabbalah. How do you do Kabbalah? It's nice to talk about, you know, again, the ideas, but what about the rituals? How does it work? What, what, what's the Kabbalistic toolkit? What, what are the ritual objects that are used? How are they used? Why would they be used? Um, what does it mean to scroll, uh, 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 you know, a 30 foot parchment that maps out the cosmology described in the teachings of Isaac Luria? You know, um, you know what's, a, what's a heretical diagram look like? These are, so th those are fun and interesting questions for me. And, and um, you know this, so in a certain way, although the subjects don't seem immediately to connect to each other, um, this this book, in a in a in a very real way, is a is the, is another attempt on my part to take uh, Kabbalah and and ground it in some kind of reality, real life history, human beings, practitioners. Um, uh, objects, material culture, um, and so you know that. And, and uh, I, I fell in love with this material while I was working on it. it. Really turned me into a manuscript person for the first time in my career in a in a significant way. I still feel like in the digital age, when we can do everything on Zoom, we think, and we can find all the manuscripts digitized. We think uh, that nothing compares to going and touching and holding and feeling uh, the real the real objects uh, and I have to thank uh, Penn State University Press for going all the way with me on this and including uh, a number of gatefolds which uh, people maybe outside of publishing might think of more in terms of center folds, uh, but you know, these fold out pages, because it's very hard in a book of any imaginable size to do justice to a 30 foot long scroll. How do you, how do you show someone in a way that they can appreciate what it means to have a 30 foot long scroll um, in a book that's you know, eight by 10, but the fold outs go a long way and the folks at the press were very kind to indulge me in those. So anyway, my answer. Well, I have a, we have an audience question for Yael. And Yahushua's impact will not stop with his death. And the question is, um, where do you see his work having the greatest impact for future generations? And unmute. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad that question was first in the chat so that I had a little bit of time to, to try to think about it. It's a, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, since I'm a literary historian, I put on my historian hat, I'm not allowed to prophecy, right? <laughs> no prophesize just to, to tell you about the past. So maybe I can answer rather than where I I think his legacy will be most felt where I would love, love to see it be most felt. And that is like a gnon in teaching readers and readers also who might be future writers to have that kind of perspectivism, that kind of historical perspective where the present is, is, is related to the past, whether where we acknowledge that the past overshadows in many ways the present, or, or if it doesn't, you know, 
completely overshadow it, it 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 does have a burden on the present but and Yoshua is this this point is very strong the the um bringing the characters and the reader to a realization that is up to us to decide what to do with all of that background with all of that burden with all of that shadow so we we can't get out of it but we can decide how to act with um our circumstances so i hope that yoshua's writing will inspire further writing that acknowledges the past in light of the future and the responsibility of the present. Thank you. And it's hard when you have, when you're very, when you're actually, you know, close to your subject, right? And then, you know, how, how do you work with that? And I think your objectivity in the book is really, really strong. Like I, I've, the analyses were right on. Um, and Yossi, do you have a favorite Ilanote? If so, uh, what about it makes what's special about it to you? Uh, such a hard question. That's like asking me if I have a favorite child. And that should that shouldn't be that shouldn't be fair. But I will. Um, I if let's just say if you ask me tomorrow, I might give you a different answer. But to for for the for the moment, I'm gonna show you um, an Ilan that's in Munich at the uh, at the great in the great uh, uh, Staatsbibliothek in Munich. It's enormous, uh, meaning uh, that it's a, roughly a meter wide and a number of meters in length. And I, I can you see this? I'm, I'll even do a quick kind of scroll down, but it's uh, quite a colorful parchment produced uh, in the late 17th century by uh, a cantor and scribe and uh, something of an artist like uh, above the uh, named Nossa Neta Hammerschlag. And he calls it the Ilan of the primordial Adam. And I love it for many reasons. Uh, but I guess the easiest reason to provide on one foot, to be very Jewish about it, is that Hammerschlag has visualized the primordial Adam, which is the, you might say, the kind of the personal God that, that is uh, part of the Lurianic Kabbalistic universe, the first expression of divinity that is differentiated from the infinite, the simple infinite called Ein Sof in the Kabbalah. But he's visualized the primordial Adam as a Habsburg emperor. So, um, and I even found a wonderful etching of Leopold I that seems to have been the model for his primordial Adam. And if you look carefully, uh, you don't necessarily even have to look all that carefully. You can see uh, the crown, which is based on the crown fashioned for Rudolf II, and uh, now in in Vienna, the famous Habsburg crown is on the head of the primordial Adam. He's got a, a good Habsburgian mustache. It has uh, a pop-up tongue, and so many of these crazy features. You can see. Uh, here, it's just uh, really kind of mind-blowing. And to, it's, of course, unbelievably anthropomorphic. Uh, so for people who aren't accustomed to some of these Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic visualizations, it's a shocker also. Um, and and um, although I don't think you can say that it's unbelievably anthropomorphic because it also happens to be Sabbatean, uh, the fact is, it, it also happens to be Sabbatean, which is not maybe something I have time to explain right now, but there are also some delightfully um, heretical things going on in this that have nothing to do, at least uh, outwardly, with 
the anthropomorphic representation of the divine that you see on display here. So that is uh, a big favorite. I don't know if you can still see my shared screen, if it's changing as I close some of the windows here. This is a beautiful scroll from Bill Gross's collection um, and uh, a magical, one of the many, many magical scrolls, not competing uh, to be my favorite, but um, yeah, the, the other one is this incredible Renaissance scroll that's at the Bodleian and Oxford University, which has 33,000 word, uh, a 33,000 word anthology of texts taken from the Kabbalists library, the, the Kabbalist of 16th century Italy. Um, and uh, it's, it's simply extraordinary. This one you can actually explore already now on www.elanote.org, but the, uh, we're still uploading the translation. So if you are looking and feel frustrated, come back in a week or two, the translation should be fully available very soon. Right, we're, we're almost out of time. I want to ask, um, got one question for Lior, if we can do this really, just real quick. Um, how did you decide among so many evocative photographs, which to include in the book? Um, thanks. Um, the choice was to show the widest possible uh, spectrum of Jewish life in Iran. So we had to choose, um, we divided to two different sections, one, um, focuses on religious life and the other on the mundane, secular, regular life, everyday life of Jews in Iran. And we wanted to show, and it connects to some other points, uh, it wanted to show the interactions that Jews are not secluded and live in their own bubble. They are part of the Iranian society. They interact with the non-Jewish Iranians on a regular basis. They, they, they have a uh, very strong investment in the Iranian political, public, cultural life. They, they are very proud of their Iranian heritage. Uh, they are, you know, every Iranian Jewish uh, family story begins with 2,700 years ago we arrived. So it's a, they, they, they are very invested in this narrative that their history is part of the Iranian soil. And this is what we wanted to show that it's, Part that the Jewish community, the Jewish communities of Iran are part of every aspect of the Iranian life. And we wanted also to highlight the Jewish aspects of the Iranian Jewish uh, community. So I wish we could take more questions, and but we can't. We're actually out of time. So I want to thank all of our authors for joining us today to talk about their work and to thank everyone who's tuned in um, as well. Attendees will receive a follow-up email with links to all of these books, as well as a special discount code for 40% off. In addition, if you'd like to find out more about our virtual events, as well as these wonderful books, please visit psupress.org and follow the press on Twitter and Facebook. I'm wishing everybody a great rest of your week and thank you so much for attending today. Thank you, Samantha. Feel good.